Good evening. It's uh, Monday, March 25th at 5.30 p.m. And uh, we're in our city council work session. And so for this evening, I guess we don't have Ms. Pacheco, but uh, Mayor Graham will go ahead and give us the mayor update. Madam Chair, I'd like to add to the agenda a work session for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategy for negotiations, and or instructing negotiators under CRS section 24-6-402, parent 4, parent E, and to discuss the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of any real personal property or other property interest pursuant to CRS 24-6-402, parent four, parent A. And I just want to add that to the end of the agenda. Thank you. Mayor Graham. Thank you, Councilor Maestri. Uh, two announcements today out of the city. The emergency declaration has been extended for tonight, Monday, March 25th at 7 p.m. through Friday, March 29th at 9 a.m. We're going to have some um, nightly lows. So for our partners that are able to shelter people, um, you can do so through Friday morning. And then also today is Medal of Honor Day at the City of Pueblo. We unveiled the new street corridor signs at Drew Dix Parkway at the Love's Truck Stop. It was with great pride that we unveil special new corridor markers that will be installed on street name signs along the roads of the City of Pueblo named for the recent <laughs> the Congressional Medal of Honor. The new sign at Drew Dix Parkway is one of many new updates for all the Medal of Honor recipients, including Master Sergeant William John Crawford. Leonard Sitter and Captain Raymond and Gerald Jerry Murphy. Um, these were the signs that the council saw um, a couple weeks ago that Mr. Hayes brought. And so the first uh, the first one is up and we unveiled it this morning right off of uh, Drew Dix Parkway um, next to Love's truck station. And that concludes my um, announcements. And I would be more than happy to take anything back uh, for the city if the city has any direction. Any questions from council? Seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead and move to our next um, presenter and that's with Mr. Gil Romero. Um, he is our lobbyist with Capital Success Group and he's going to be giving us an update on everything that's going on up at the Capitol. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of city council, President Aliff and, and Mayor Graham. Uh, we are in the 76th day of 120 day session. Uh, lots of really, some really positive things I wanted to tell you about. One, uh, great press uh, for the Pueblo flag for flying on Friday uh, at the Capitol, got a lot of attention and uh, I thought it was really positive. Uh, secondly, uh, and this goes under the category, I think sometimes uh, we ask ourselves and I, I asked myself when I was an elected official, you know, am I making a difference? And I want you to know that uh, the resolution uh, that you did on 1338 and the letters that you have sent are, are making a difference on some of these bills that were introduced. Uh, we're starting to see amendments to some of these bills. Uh, they're still not in a position where I think industry and Evraz and manufacturing is supporting them, uh, but they certainly are going in the right direction. And we have heard from a number of, of uh, legislators, uh, the importance of, of the resolutions. Uh, we plan on distributing those resolutions or that resolution of 1338 on the floor of the House uh, and our delegation will present that. The other thing that I am really uh, are proud about is uh, the op-ed that uh, the mayor did uh, in the Denver Post. Uh, that is one of the most well-circulated uh, op-eds that we've seen today. Uh, the headline is Pueblo will unite against these threats to our blue collar jobs. And it really just outlines uh, the significance or the impact, the negative impact that uh, some of this legislation has. And this particular op-ed has been very powerful. Uh, I've actually looked into the glass and I've actually seen it on uh, uh, copies of it uh, on, uh, on members desks. So thank you uh, for all of that work because it's making a difference. I wanted to bring to your attention tonight uh, a, a, a bill that I spoke about uh, last week, but I think uh, it's something for the city council to, to look at. Uh, we're either recommending that you take a position of amend so that we can start working on the bill, 
or 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 for you to look at opposing the bill. And it is a, a House Bill 1372 regulating law enforcement use of prone restraint. I think you saw the uh, article by our uh, Pueblo Chief of Police uh, who has serious concerns about this particular bill. Uh, it really just from an operational standpoint for a police officer that arrests somebody, brings them to the ground before they could handcuff them, they'd have to bring them back up to the on their feet. Uh, there are just a lot of issues on, on how this is going to work. I, I will let you know that uh, uh, the, the Colorado Municipal League is in the, the amend position on this bill, but most cities, the city of Colorado Springs is opposed, Weld County, a number of counties are opposed to the bill. Uh, if they're not opposed to the bill, then they're in the amend position. But uh, on behalf of the city of Pueblo, we'd like to be able to start working on this bill and trying to to, to either uh, get in a position where it's workable for law enforcement or have you oppose the bill. So if you guys could take a look at that bill uh, and I will turn it over to Ryan and Alec as part of our report tonight. Uh, but I, I think it's one that uh, I, you know, a, a letter would suffice, but if you think it, it rises to the level in terms of law enforcement, uh, to do a, a resolution. This bill is going to be heard on, I believe, on April 4th. So we have a little bit of time, uh, but we'd like the, the, the city council to take uh, take a look at that and uh, and and uh, the city attorney. And I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I, Gil kind of touched on a couple of the things. I just wanted to go over what happened with the air bills last week. Um, and again, a big thank you to the mayor for coming up and the group of uh, EVRAS employees for doing that big rally on the West Steps. It was, uh, it was a good showing for, for Pueblo and Pueblo Strong. Um, so the first bill is Senate Bill 166, the air quality enforcement. This was heard on Wednesday um the bill passed out of committee its next hearing will be in senate finance it passed on a 4-3 vote and notably senator henrickson from pueblo voted against it saying that despite the amendments the proposal hadn't yet gotten the enforcement formula right um, committee members passed several amendments including a provision excluding paperwork problems and other non non emission related violations from the bill scope. It specifies that certain circumstances such as violations resulting from proven malfunctions under applicable applicable commission rules voluntary disclosure according to um, section or disclosure in environmental self audit conducted under section 25 are not considered violations within the context of the subsection. So essentially it outlines exceptions or, or situations where certain actions or events do not count as violations. Um, so as Gil said, that's a step in the right direction. Um, the bill still has a, a long way to go. Uh, th so the next, the other air quality bill um, our environmental bill is House Bill 1338, Cumulative Impacts and Environmental Justice. This was heard on Thursday of last week. It also passed out of its first committee on a vote of nine to four. Um, and this is the bill that creates the Office of Environmental Justice to further address cumulative impacts and further sets parameters around the refinery regulations. Uh, the amendments to House Bill 1338 strengthen the consideration of cumulative impacts, empower agencies and local governments in evaluating mitigation options, mandate accessible and comprehensive environmental and economic cost benefit impact analysis, or ECAs, and impose restrictions on the department from accepting industry gifts or donations. The most significant amendment was the removal of Section 4, which granted local gov governing bodies authority to request the Air Quality Control Commission to impose limits on new or increased operational emissions of health-related air pollutants within their jurisdictions. Um, so that's a, again, as Gil said, we're going to, we've got a lot of work to go. Both of these still have to go through appropriations and 
I'm not sure if Gil, you were going to talk about the budget a little bit, but this, this week is budget week. So we're kind of all uh, waiting to see what each caucus does, what kind of sponsors and, and where the overall uh, budget will end up at the end of the week. Um, so I'll pass it back to Gil or Alec to discuss some of the new legislation or the budget. Thank you. So just uh, just a quick update on the budget. And, uh, you know, obviously the state budget is really important, but it's really important, uh, you know, particularly for us because there are a number of these bills that have significant impact on manufacturing that have a huge price tag. Uh, the permitting bill would require the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to hire 30 new FTE. So uh, we're also using that as a mechanism uh, to uh, be able to reach compromise on amendments or outright uh, uh, kill uh, some of the, the more uh, excessive uh, overreaching bills. And so the budget will, pl will play a part in that because uh, they only have $24 million uh, set aside 12 million for the House and 12 million for the Senate uh, in order to prioritize a number of bills, including a significant price tag for child welfare and some other bills that could uh, pretty much take all of that 24 million. So that's where the budget will come in and uh, it'll start in the House on Wednesday. Uh, they'll, they'll caucus on Thursday and then go over to the Senate and then we'll start to see whether or not uh, some of these environmental bills will probably fall because uh, they can't uh, they can't obtain an appropriation. Uh, that's that's our report for tonight. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, any questions from council? I will make a statement. Okay. Uh, uh, Gail, I will. Uh, this is President Aliff. I'll I'll make sure that we that I get a a uh, resolution on the next regular meeting on the uh, restraint law. Okay, thank you very much, President Aliff. And um, Councilor Flores. Uh, Gail, uh, is it premature for us to be uh, maybe corresponding with the uh, the governor and expecting? Uh, him to veto any of these, uh, especially the environmental bill. It is, is there value in doing that at a certain time? Is it too premature? Should we not do it? Um, you know, the, the, the governor has been coming to Pueblo an awful lot and taking credit for a lot of the uh, environmental, uh, the, the carbon reduction, uh, you know, our mill that's going to be fully solar operated. Uh, the advance, the uh, addition to C uh, the CS winds, uh, but what is your opinion on that? <clears throat> well, I don't think I don't, I don't think it's ever too early to engage the governor's office. We actually have been talking to their legislative liaison. Uh, when we uh, pass the resolution out on the floor, uh, we plan to uh, take uh, a copy of the resolution to the governor's office. But I'll probably have more specific. Uh, uh, requests of, of both uh, the mayor, the president, and city council. Uh, once we sort of see where these bills end up in terms of amendments, uh, we're hoping that some of them we can we can fix uh, to the point where uh, manufacturing uh, may stand down. But I think that there are a couple of bills that I don't think can be, and that's where we're going to really ask you then at that sort of precise time once we know that the bills have finalized to. Uh, to uh, to to make some contact with the governor's office, but we'll let you know that. Yeah, thank you. I, I think you're right. Timing is uh, the important thing here, so let us know. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we want to see them in their final stage. I'd hate for you to go down and or for us to make a statement, and then the you know the uh, a, a provision of the bill that we were opposed to gets eliminated. So I want them to be in their final uh, stage of of amendments so that we can then uh, make our comments to the governor. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Anyone else? Anything else from Mr. Romero and your group? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the time as always. Great, thank you for updating us and we look forward to seeing you next week. Great. Thank you.
All right. Um, so uh, for the remaining of the work session, we're going to uh, next month is child awareness, uh, child abuse awareness month for the month of April. And we're going to be bringing in some speakers tonight. City attorney. Um, <laughs> I was really anxious for that. I'm sorry. Uh, next, we have our city attorney, um, and we're going to discuss the um, an, a city attorney, for, uh, an attorney for council, and our admin. Thank yes. you. I'm way ahead of myself tonight. Okay, I can do that. So, Madam Chair, members of council, you asked um, for me to come and talk to you about um, city attorney's office and city council's ability to hire and their own council, um, their own outside council. So, um, in preparation for this, I put together some ethics guidelines for the legal department that I sent out to all of you last week um, for you to review. And I'm happy to answer questions about any of that, but I wanted to go over um, my position as far as what the charter says. Um, so city council has the ability and power to adopt ordinances, resolutions, and other legislative conductive to the welfare of the people of the city. That's not inconsistent with the city charter. Part of that is your ability to hire personnel necessary to enable council to do um, its business and perform its duties. Um, that's all part of charter section 3.5. Uh, the, the law department exercises all legal and administrative function of the municipal government assigned by ordinance um, to the city attorney. One of those functions that is assigned to the city attorney is that it is the city attorney's um, role under the charter um, to hire special counsel. And it specifically says that no special counsel shall be retained to represent the municipal government or an agency except by the city attorney. And when that special counsel is retained, that that special counsel is under the direction and under the supervision of the city attorney. There's only two instances in which city council can hire its own attorney. And that is if there's an irregularity found by audit or there's an alleged dereliction in the executive departments. Um, those are the only two circumstances that the charter allows city council to hire its own outside counsel. Um, so it's a city attorney's role and it's always been the city attorney's role to hire counsel as needed by the city. Um, you asked last time we spoke what the other cities do. Within the state of Colorado, there's only three cities that have the strong mayor form of government, and that's us, Denver, and Colorado Springs. Um, we did check with Denver and Colorado Springs. Both of those cities have a law department. Within that law department, they assign an attorney to provide legal services for city council, um, which is the same model that um, we're currently using in this city attorney's office, um, and that I plan to continue to use. So just so we can talk about some of the um, expectations of the city attorney's office and I and hopefully alleviate some of the concerns that city council has, city attorney's office represents the city as a whole. Doesn't represent any individual person within that city that includes the mayor, or members of city council, um, department heads. It in, represents the city as a whole. Now the city acts through its various representatives. So they have different representatives that act within the city. Um, and so the city attorney's office is gonna have interactions with those people individually. You can act as legal advisor to all of those different in, uh, representatives, city council, individual members of city council, uh, the mayor, city departments, enterprises, boards and commissions and city staff. And in order to do that, the city attorney assigns attorneys within the law department to provide legal services um, and support for each of those different areas. And that's what we've done right now. I have um, the deputy city attorney, Harley Gifford, has been assigned to provide legal services for city council. Um, some members of city council have already contacted him directly with questions that they had, um, things they want him to look at. 
um, ordinances they wanted him to consider and, and talk to him about drafting, and he's already working on that. So that's already happening. That's a direct line of communication. Um, and so that's how we've done it. Every, office, every lawyer in the office is required to exercise independent professional judgment and render candid advice. That's by our rules of professional conduct, and that's statewide. That's not just here in the city. Um, but that's our duty as lawyers is to do that. And that doesn't change whether we represent the city or we represent individuals in private practice. We're still required to do that. And we're required to give candid advice, even if that advice is not going to be well received, um, because that's our job. Now, um, before I move on to that, one of the things we talked about in um, the guidelines that I presented to you are the different roles that attorneys have. And one of the roles that an attorney has is to be an advisor. And when we act in the advisor role, we give advice based upon not only the law, but the politics and circumstances, practical circumstances that are involved in that, any kind of risk that's to the city, whether it be legal or practical risk or political risk. Those are all things that we provide um, and we include in our advice when we're providing legal services. And again, that's every lawyer in the law department does that, and it's candid to whoever they're, they're giving that advice to. Um, you folks have said you want to hire your own lawyer, and I have some concerns with that. There's some, there's some reasons why it isn't a good idea, and, and that is, one, conflict of interest with the city. So if you hire your own attorney, he's going to be representing city council. He, isn't, he or she is not going to be representing any member of you individually. It's going to be city council, but it is not going to be the city as a whole. Um, the only person, the only office that represents the city as a whole is the city attorney's office. Uh, so uh, you're going to run into potential conflicts of interest. Uh, so you're going to have potential conflicts where there's a duty to city council, even if that is detrimental to the city, um, you're going to have some potential conflicts. And then you, with those conflicts, you're going to have competing potential legal opinions and conflicts. You're going to have delays and resolutions of issues because you're going to have to work out those resolutions before you can go any further with that. And then it's how are those conflicts are going to be resolved. Is that going to have to, you guys are going to have an attorney, and then we have a, the city attorney's office has a position, and then we're going to have a third attorney that's going to come in and mediate that and decide what the ultimate outcome is going to be. Does that mean we're going to have to go to the, the district court and get a declaratory judgment as to which is the correct um, uh opinion or process to follow based upon the charter and the ordinances and the powers of everybody involved. I mean, that's the kind of just taking this down worst case scenario, because that's my job as a lawyer, is to look at worst case scenario. Um, so if you do that, there's potential, li not liability, but there's potential litigation there and, and um, delays in getting things city business done. The other thing is, is more practical concerns. When you have an, an attorney that you're going to hire that's in private practice, you're going to be competing against all their other clients. So they're not going to be as readily available for you. Right now, city, the city attorney's office, you have a direct, direct line of communication with the attorney that's been assigned to you for legal services. Um, and so, and they're, they're there every day of the week ready to help you. Um, I'm not sure you're going to get that same service with an outside counsel. Um, the outside counsel isn't going to have ready access to city information or staff. So uh, myself and the other attorneys that work within the law department are going to all these different meetings um, with different members of, of city government and departments. We have background knowledge. We have knowledge about all the different nuances that are going on within the city and different third-party uh, partners that we have that I'm not sure that um, a third-party attorney is going to have that same depth of knowledge. And so you're, there's going to be a learning curve there every time you assign a project to them. Um, and the cost is, is going to be something you're going to have to consider. I know the council has a certain amount budgeted for a city attorney at this point. Um, but if you're going to hire outside council, um, I think I was pretty conservative on my estimate of the hourly rate. You're looking at between $200 and $300 an hour. Um, estimate 20 hours a week at $250 an hour, you're going to be paying close to $260,000 annually um, for outside counsel. Um, 
And that is if you don't want someone to work full time, if they're only working part time, and obviously that's going to be different. It's not going to be 20 hours probably every week, but you're going to have some weeks where it's more, some weeks where it's less. So you run into a cost issue. Um, so those are my concerns, just practical concerns, some legal concerns. Um, and these legal concerns, some of the case law that was cited in the guidelines that I provided you along with the, the professional rules deal with these exact same issues and how they had to litigate the issues because of the competing interests between the two lawyers. So this isn't something that is too far-fetched. Um, so you're going to run into issues. And when you have different, different clients... You can get competing legal opinions. So you can have a lawyer that reads something differently because of the needs or the desires of the client is going to take a different tactic than if you're looking at it for the best interests of the city and the client as a city. And that's where you're going to run into issues where there's possibly a conflict between the two. Um, you know, as it is, we already hire outside counsel if there's complex or specialized areas of law. So, for instance, we have attorneys that come in and, and counsel on water law, um, in some environmental issues. We've had special counsel. We have special counsel for most of our litigation um, because that's time consuming. We don't really have the staff in the office to do that. So we already uh, contract out some of the specialized areas that we deal with here at the city. Um, if we need outside counsel because the office lacks resources, for instance, like litigation, um, some boards and commissions, then we would contract that out to special counsel, but that all goes through the city attorney's office. Uh, if there is potential conflicts in a case, then we're going to, going to contract that out as well. So for instance, if there was a legal dispute, a valid legal dispute, not just a disagreement of ideas, but a legal dispute between city council and the mayor, that would be something that most likely would be contracted out and there would be attorneys, outside attorneys on both sides. Um, so that would be a potential. We also have uh, claims made by employees against the city. Um, that would be something that would might be contracted out if the interests of the city, if there were direct claims against the two. Um, so that may be something it's all talked about in the guidelines that I presented. Uh, so those are all examples of times that we already contract out. Obviously, if there's a particular issue that comes up that um, we need a more specialized uh, expertise, then we will contract that out to somebody else. Um, so that that is generally what it looks like. Um, and so the, the basic answer to your question is that the charter does not allow city council to hire its own council, except in those two instances that are provided for in the council. Um, so that's my answer to your question. And I understand you guys have some reservations. And so I'm happy to listen about what concerns you have with the city attorney's office. And, and we're here to serve all of the different representatives of the city, including city council. So if there's something that we can do um, to help that, then I'm I'm willing to listen, and and we want to be of service to to all of you. Um, but I I need to know a little bit more specifically, I guess, about what the concerns are, and understand we have a new mayor, we have a new city attorney, um, we have uh, some new attorneys coming into the office, so the landscape looks a little bit different now than it has over the last you know several years. So I don't know. I'm I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Councilor Anna. Thank you for the information. That's uh, it felt almost like deja vu because I've been through the presentation before with the previous city attorney. Hmm. So when you talk about the charter, when the charter was written and it said that uh, city council can hire an attorney, it was directed at. Uh, directly towards auditing. And if you read the charter language, that's specifically what it says is on an audit or whatever. So we have to go back to 2017 when a strong mayor was elected. When a strong mayor was elected, actually section 3.5 where the general powers of city council are put in, uh, they were amended in 2000, 
in 2017 after the strong mayor was elected simply because now you had a total different power structure within the city. It literally said in, in, in section 35G, which you stated clearly, was that city council can hire the personnel necessary to enable the council to adequately, adequately perform its duties. It doesn't exclude in that language an attorney. Uh, it doesn't exclude literally anything. It just says we have that power to hire the personnel necessary to enable the council to adequately uh, perform its duties. I understand and agree with you that there seems to be a conflict between that language and the language that was written many, many years before that on exactly what city council can do. Uh, <clears throat> For that reason, and I, I made that statement the last meeting that we had, that's why we need an attorney. You're telling us we can't hire an attorney. Uh, we believe, or I believe, that the charter says we can hire an attorney uh, to advise us in sticky areas, which this would be one of them, to make sure that we're, we're, we're listening to all sides of the of the issue. I'm not an attorney. I don't know. I don't know if I'm right, wrong, or indifferent. All I know is when I read it as just a citizen of the city of Pueblo, I assume that city council does have that power to hire whoever they need to do their duties. So when a when a strong mayor was brought into play, the dynamics of municipal government changed. When we were on city, I would happen to be on city council when we had a city manager. And when we went to the strong mayor form of government, everything changed. The dynamics changed. When we worked, when city council worked as a strong council with the city manager, city council could literally fire the manager uh, and, and go on and do things however they wanted to do because they had the power to do that. With a strong mayor, obviously, city council doesn't have that power. There is a distinct, in my opinion, uh, conflict of interest in certain areas between the city attorney's office and city council. For instance, city council doesn't necessarily represent city employees. City council represents the voters the people who elected them to be the voice for them on city council and to run the city, the, the things that they had control over and, and be the representative voice of the community. Just in that sense, there seems to be a conflict of interest. There's been several instances, and I'm not gonna bore everybody here tonight with those specific instances, uh, but I know Councilor Flores had problems when we were dealing with municipalization. Uh, there were other times uh, through the strong mayor process that city council didn't feel like we were getting good advice. And we literally were like a flag waving in the wind without any way to get any other advice. And that's when this whole concept came about. And the previous administration agreed that we had the right to do that and that, that we could do that. I don't even know if city council has the wherewithal to hire an attorney. All I know is that if we, we had put out an RFP before, we were in the process, we interviewed attorneys before, we just didn't go through with hiring one. Now, all of a sudden, all of that's thrown out the window, again, because now you have different legal representation now it said all those things you did before under the same government, the same form of government, uh, you can't do now because it's all different. It's not right. They interpreted it totally different than you interpret it because isn't that what law is? It's an interpretation. That's why we have an appeals court, a state Supreme Court, and a Supreme Court, a federal Supreme Court is because lawyers make opinions and it's not always right. That's all I'm saying. And I think city council has the right to have an attorney. So if we have to go to court to figure out who's right on the on the uh, charter, I don't know. I, if city council wants to do that, they can do that. But, but that's my that's my take on it. So if I could just respond. So um, first of all, let me just say that 
while the dynamics of city government may have changed with the strong mayor coming on, the dynamics in the city law department did not, and our responsibilities did not change. Um, we represent the city and the best interests of the city. That has never changed. Um, so while the dynamics may have changed um, politically between the executive and legislative branches, did not change um, anything in the city attorney's office. Um, and in fact, it's my understanding that right after the strong mayor came on board, there was a presentation to council from CML. Um, Mr. Mamet came down along with representatives from um, the city of Colorado Springs, two council members from the city of Colorado Springs and two representatives from the law department of the city of Colorado Springs. And they talked about the responsibilities of the city attorney's office consistent to what I'm telling you today. Um, so that was given at the outset of that change in government. And so that was consistent. Um, and the, the now that, you know, you've had another attorney, another city attorney um, tell you, yes, go ahead and, and send out an RFP. As a city attorney, he has the ability, I suppose, to say, I'll hire special counsel. I don't know specifically how that would work. But if he was willing to hire special counsel um, to do that, to represent city council, then I suppose he could do that. Um, I, I don't know how it was presenting, so I can't really speak to that. But I can tell you that the legal advice that I know from the time I started in the city attorney's office in 2010 um, to when the change in government happened to the strong mayor, um, to a legal opinion that I found written by Bob Jagger, all of the attorneys have been consistent in saying that um, the city attorney's office represents the city and the only person, the only office that can hire legal counsel is the city attorney's office. And that is consistent with charter. When you talk about the different language in statutory construction, when you're looking at language, you're gonna go to the more specific than you are to the general. So if you have a provision in city charter that talks about um, generally you can hire personnel, which would include um, admin, um, then you're going to look to the other part of the, the charter that is going to be more specific, where it specifically talks about the city attorney and the specific um, provision is going to control. Um, so that's just statutory construction. Uh, so I, I understand where you're coming from. I don't know where the other city attorney was as far as hiring outside counsel. I know you did an RFP. I know you guys have interviewed. All I can tell you is what the charter says. Um, and what, as statutory interpretation guides us, what it what it means. Uh, Councilor Council 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 Council. yeah, I just have some uh, some questions. Uh, this will be the third time I've dealt with this issue, and uh, uh, I'm still I'm, I'm really on, on your side. I'm, I'm I really don't want us to hire a separate attorney, and there's some reasons for that. Uh, number one. Uh, if if you were the person I, I selected um, as our separate attorney under a contractual arrangement, apart and away from our city attorney office, uh, and you were looking at the RFP and you were looking at what we wanted to do as a city council, my question to you is, would any reputable attorney uh, get involved in this kind of arrangement? The last two times we sent RFPs, I think we had two two submissions. And the last one, we may have had three, but one of them pulled out at the last moment. But once they understand and they read the charter and they look at what they're expected to do for us independently, I really fear that any reputable law firm would want to get themselves involved in that kind of uh, morass. It's really... Um, you know, that I mean, I'm I'm just asking you how you you would feel about that, and 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 I know that we would get. There has to be some attorneys out there that are that would get involved because they're hungry. But uh, I'm just wondering what the quality would be to get themselves involved in this kind of uh, very unusual situation. It would be a unique situation because we would be the only city doing this. Yeah, it would be a unique situation. I can't speak to really to the other attorneys. I'm, I'm sure you're, obviously you've had some attorneys that have responded to the RFP. Um, so I, I can't speak to what their qualifications would be at, at this point. Um, 
but I, we would be the only city um, doing that. If you if you had uh, two competing ordinances <clears throat> that fell on your desk, uh, one that was authored by our attorney, one was authored by you, uh, what is your obligation under the city charter as to what one, which one you would choose uh, to bring forward? Under the city charter, the city attorney's legal position is the legal position of the city. So it would be the ordinance that was drafted by and approved by the city attorney's office. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing that I want to clarify, you know, uh, before we come before council and we present pretty much anything, I, I can't think of it a single time where anybody from the law department has come before city council and presented anything to city council where there hasn't been a healthy discussion in the law department about what wants, what anybody wants to accomplish, what are the competing legal issues, the practical issues, the political issues. Those are all conversations that we have within the law department. There are many times where I disagreed with other opinions or takes from other attorneys in the office and vice versa. And, and ultimately what we did is we came to an agreement on what was a reasonable solution and what would accomplish the goals of whoever we were talking to and what they wanted to accomplish um, you know, within the parameters of the law. So there is disagreement within the law department about certain legal positions, and we talk about that, and it's a, it's a healthy discussion. And then we come to, um, in a, you know, a consensus essentially as to what the, the best move forward is for the, for the office and what we're, what we're going to put forward. But, um, you know, anytime we come to council, if there is a split in legal opinion, is there if there's more than one way to present something, then generally speaking, we're going to tell you that too. You know, you want to do X. The law says that you can't do it. Let's try to do Y because the law says that we can accomplish maybe the same thing you want to accomplish, but doing it a different way. Or if there's a split. Well, you know, the, the courts are split on this right now. You could do it, but you face potential liability because it's uncertain. And there may be, you know, some people that are going to come back and push back on that. We, we tell you that. And I've heard, I've done it. And I've heard other lawyers tell you that, um, you know, that there could be pushback on what we want to do because the law is unclear. So those are things that already happen. Um, I don't know. If that we we have the relationship with our insurance carrier, CIRSA where um, they do have the ability to go out and uh, hire a specialist, uh, depending on the lawsuit that we're involved in. How does that operate? I mean, do they do they come to you and indicate, you know, we're going to defend you, but we're going to select the law firm because they're a specialist? And do you have to, uh, do you have to approve of that? City attorney approves all of that. Right. So CERSA comes to us and they say, we need to hire this attorney because of this, or even experts, anything like that. And they will come to the city attorney. The city attorney they talks just, about that. Don't. We discuss who the attorneys are that they're recommending. Um, and then we we approve it. Right. Yeah. Thank you. City attorney approves it. Thank you. Um, Councilor Martinez. Um, I agree with uh, Councillor Flores. I think, one, Mr. Gifford has replied timely, and Carla, even you as well, have replied timely to all of the emails so far with the resolutions, the ordinance that I, the ordinances that I'm working on. Um, you've been really responsive, so I'm not, I'm not necessarily worried about, uh, about lack of capacity, given that Mr. Gifford is now Deputy Attorney, so that's not a worry for me anymore. Two, I think that the ethics code that you provided for us clearly differentiates and also um, describes how you how the attorney's office is going to be covering both um, our city council, the departments, and the mayor. And so it's not just like the, it, you are the you know the mayor's um, attorney it, when the ethics code clearly says it says in there that um, city council is, is a part of that whole structure as well. So I'm not worried about that. And then th um, three, I, you know, I, to Carla's point earlier, I really recommend that this council take into effect that it would be $260,000 a year for this council or to hire our own council. Um, when we're, I mean, when we're talking about budgets and trimming down the fat, that just seems like an unneeded expense, particularly when we have Two great attorneys who are going to, who are already working on our behalf. Um, so I propose that we 
um, not move forward with this. And perhaps a good compromise is to wait for six months to see how this system is working and then reevaluate after that six months so we can see what the with uh, how this is working with Carla as the new attorney, Mr. Gifford uh, as the new deputy attorney. So I propose that we we trial this for six months and then re revisit it. To Councillor Aleph's point earlier, that I, I understand that we're representing constituents, but we should have the exact same goal. All of us should have the exact same goal of taking care of our city and to improving the city. And sometimes that looks different, even in the, it, it, even for our PNZ commission that I have sat on for two years. Um, that that may look different, and there's there there can be discussions and disagreements. But we all should have the shared vision, the shared goal of making the city better as best we can. Okay, and now um, council, are you finished? Yes. Uh, okay. I don't even know why we're discussing it. The the city attorneys made a legal determination that we can't do it. Let's move on and go to something else because this is not going to happen. Uh, we've been we've been told no, and we do we don't have another no we have no other way to go to get to remedy it. So it's it's a moot point, and we're just wasting time here. Well, just for the record, uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, Many of the merits of which uh, Councillor Aleph has stated earlier, I agree with. I had not gotten to the point to where I had decided that, uh, or my my position was that we needed our own council. Uh, first of all, thank you for the twelve page uh, guidelines. It was pretty in depth. Um, I did uh, go out to the Colorado Rules of Professional Conduct, as adopted by the Colorado Supreme Court, September eighth, twenty twenty two and read all of that, okay? So, uh, and I also had um, a conversation with City Attorney um, Macy, Massey from Colorado Springs today. And uh, uh, she stated uh, many of the same similarities and points that you, you have as well. So there, there's consistency at least between what you have presented here because it's excerpts out of, for the most part, uh, the su Supreme Court uh, professional conduct of rules. However, there's a, there's a couple of things that I want to highlight in this 12 pages, if I may. Okay? I'm not going to go in, in real detailed depth. But as a city attorney, as an advocate, looking at uh, what you provided in the summary here, what I did find in the, in the uh, Paul Supreme Court, the full document, if you will, Rule, rule 3.1, meritorious claims and contentions. And as you know, there's many footnotes within all these documents. And I'm not an attorney, but I'm a professional. But as I read, uh, and as in paragraph B of what you provided on page one, at the very end of the last, very last sentence, which states that uh, as an advocate, a lawyer should not bring or defend a proceeding or assert or controvert an issue therein unless there's a basis in law. In fact, for doing so, that is not frivolous, which includes a good faith argument for an extension modification or reversal of an existing law. And what I found in 3.1, Meritorious Claims and Contentions, is footnote one also included, however, the law is not always clear and never static. Accordingly, in determining the proper scope of advocacy, account must be taken of the law's ambiguities and potential for change. Okay. In footnote two, uh, when what is required of lawyers, however, is that they inform themselves about the facts of their clients' cases and the applicable law and determine that they can make good faith arguments in support of their client's position. Such action is not frivolous, even though the lawyer believes that the client's position ultimately will not prevail. So I just want to uh, identify those points regarding differences of opinion. The law is not is not clear cut, and you've you've addressed that as well. Um, I like to look at uh, page six of of your document. And at paragraph D, which addresses multiple constituent representations. Okay. 
So as I read through this, uh, back to Councillor Amos' point, and correct me if, if I if, if I don't understand this right, but the client is the city, and the city is the entity. Okay, correct. Okay, so the client is the city, and it goes to the entity theory. We as counselors, four districts, and at large, and as you stated earlier, document here as the oath is to the welfare of the city of Pueblo. So I look at that and says, my oath and responsibility is to the people. Your oath and, and the uh, authority as city attorney is to the city, the client. And there can be and will be differences of who we represent. So th there's going to be differences as to who you represent, but the legal interests are still going to be the same. I protect the legal interests of the city. The city attorney's office protects the legal interests of the city. And to the extent that the legal interests of the city are contrary to an individual citizen's, um, right, then that's the opinion that I'm going to give. Um, now, the other thing you guys are missing is I'm going to tell you what the law is. If, if you guys don't want to follow and you want to do something different, you as a council can choose to do that. Um, I'm only here to tell you what the law is. Um, so that that's going to be up to you. But there are going to be times I, the city attorney's office does not represent individual citizens of the city. Mm -hmm. um, it represents the city as a client. Um, and so you guys may have competing interests as far as what you can do as within the city, within the, the rules and procedures and law that the city is governed by, that you cannot um, accomplish whatever an individual citizen wants you to do. But that's, that's not going to change no matter who your attorney is, um, because your citizen may want you to do something that is totally contrary to the law, and, and you can't do that as a representative. So that tension is is going to exist for you guys, um, regardless. Is everyone finished for this evening, oh, Mr. Gomez? I'm just going to make it real simple because that's where my head's at. This all boils down to interpretation, if you ask me. And there's some friction between these two bodies. And just as a newbie, from what I see and what I pick up and what I hear and what I sense, and I don't believe we should wait six months to do this and again i come from a world where positions were always like like i don't care if you have this office here there's a like position over here you have this office here if you like those are for communication purposes we're all not going to see everything the same way every time it's not going to happen but again it's coming out of interpretation i don't feel comfortable with your interpretation with your, sorry, Dennis, with your interpretation, the way I see it, I think we need more time to look at this thing, but I don't think it should take six months. That's just my opinion. So can I make one more point? So what I'm hearing from council is that there's some general distrust um, with the opinions that have been coming out of the city attorney's office. And I'm not going to say that's just for me because I've been in there a very short time. Um, but over the years, obviously, this had to have been an issue. Um, and so you, you have may not have agreed with some of the opinions that came out of the city attorney's office, but this is no different than any other department. So if you have the director of finance that's telling you what you can do with the budget and you don't agree with their decision, um, are you then going to go out and hire another um, professional to give a second opinion because you disagree with that? Same thing with public works or wastewater or any other, the other departments. Um, and, and I understand that there's a, a breakdown in trust. And so that's why I'm asking for the six months. Give me an opportunity to come in and show you how it's going to work with me as a city attorney, M Mayor Graham, you folks, is, some of you are brand new council members. Give us an opportunity to work together so that we can help repair some of that trust. Because otherwise, you know, this is no different than any other department. And I don't think you'd come in and ask for a second opinion because you disagreed with something some of the other departments do. Um, and just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's any different in that regard. Um, so that's what I'm asking is six months to, to try and build that trust back with you. Um, and if we can't establish that, then we can have another conversation. But you have to let me know what you need. Let me know what you need from my office 
And we will do our best to accomplish that as long as within the rules and within our eth ethics. Mm -hmm. um, also, last thing, um, Ms. Sykes, just, just a question. Um, since it is part of the charter, the council could bring forward a request for a charter change, correct? For the people to um, decide, right? You could ask for a charter amendment. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Come my street. I, I guess too. Um, I know that even when I sat on council, there was a lot of contentiousness, like with the previous administration, the previous um, several city attorneys that we had. So I understand where your frustration is coming from. Um, but what I'd like you to think about is over the last month and a half since I've been in office, there hasn't been one time when any of you have asked Carla or her staff to write an ordinance, um, answer a question that she's come to me and said, no, absolutely not. We're not doing this. I have conversations with many of you daily on resolutions or ordinances that you need help bringing forward in which I've tried to help you bring forward. And so again, this is, I think it's, it was very contentious before, but now, I mean, I, there's not one, not one ordinance or not one resolution or not even a phone call that you guys have made in the last month and a half since I've been here that um, I've said no to or challenged or asked any questions about. Right now, you're all contacting the city attorney's office and not even running it through the mayor's office. And that's no. fine. It is true. Maybe not you. I've never called maybe the not you, President Aleph, but several of you contact the city attorney's office without even sending a CC to my office. And so I'm completely fine with you doing that. And that's not why I'm, you know, saying that, but I just think that this contentious battlefield that's been going on with the previous administration, you don't have to worry about that anymore. The city attorney's office is here to represent the city council um, and whatever we can do, whatever in the mayor's office can do to push your agendas forward, your constituency agendas forward President Aleph, you just talked about how you represent a constituency um, of citizens that you need to bring forward things that they want done. You and I share similar goals, and we've worked together on similar occasions already. We sh I share similar goals with all of you on council. And so to sit here and say that we're not all representing the same body of people, I, I just don't think that that's true. And I think that my office and the city attorney's office has done everything in their power to this day to help you with anything that you want to bring forward and that we will continue to do. Excuse me. President Ailes. Yeah, I, I, I just want to make clear that the RFPs that ever went out, we've never asked for an attorney that was going to write resolutions, was going to uh, uh, bring forward ordinances, any of that stuff. And I think what happens in these conversations is the intent of what an, a city attorney, an attorney for city council looks like and what their actual job is. So we sent out RFPs, and I think if you look at the RFP, it was never said that you're going to act as a city attorney for the city council. What it said was is that there's times when city council needs independent legal advice. We want to have an attorney on retainer. We had it in a budget for the last four years to have that attorney to give us independent advice on specific issues when we have a, a, a difference of opinion with the city attorney's office. And then we get into these conversations where it all gets warped into we're trying to hire an attorney to replace the city attorney's office, and they're going to write resolutions and ordinances, and they're going to be our advocate and do all this. That has never, ever been in the conversation. Literally, it was a city attorney to represent city council, an attorney to represent city council when times arise under contract uh, where there was a difference of opinion. And I do know that that uh, several previous counselors and and the previous mayor, the previous city attorney, all felt that we needed that representation. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden now, 
those people have all gone silent and said that we don't need that representation because I guess we're on TV and we're actually trying to make decisions about it. But I'm good with that, with your determination. My point stands that uh, we have to live with it because we don't have another opinion. So that's how we're going to move forward. So again, this goes back to, yeah, when it was, if, if Dan Kogosik was the attorney at the time, if he wanted to hire and say, you guys can go ahead and hire, that was within his purview because he had the ability to do that. Um, in this case, what you're saying is, we want to hire an attorney because we disagree with you. So then you're going to have competing legal opinions and it's going to lead to further conflict. What I'm asking you is to try it my way for six months. We have no choice. So, um, you know, if you want a choice, you can have a choice. You can always take it to district court. We can sit there and say who has the authority to do that. Um, at this point, I, I think the city attorney's office is trying to, to service whatever you need. Um, mm -hmm. so again, all I'm asking for is six months to try to repair some of that trust. Well, I think we've gotten enough information here tonight for council to, you know, circle back if they need to, um, and, uh, think about it, marinate in it for a little while and just see if we come back and have some other things that we want to address. I know you also wanted to talk about the admin position for council well, as we, well. We 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 don't have time. I mean, we went back into a whole um I don't know how many times we could have this conversation, really. So okay, so um let's get back to what we were here our other uh, business for this evening. Um I want to I want to bring this forward. It's more for an awareness. I think sometimes as a community, we get a little too comfortable um, with what's going on um, around us and our surroundings. Um, I was speaking to someone within the court system that was uh, telling me some things um, about child sexual abuse here in our community, and it, I found it to be very... Um, disheartening, uh, scary for, you know, I don't want to, I would like to just bring awareness. I'm not trying to promote fear, but, you know, we have things in our community. We always, and our children are, are so precious to us. And, and that's something when it happens to children, it's, it's not reversible and it affects their entire rest of their lives. Um, me just looking into it even further. I mean, personally, I have someone who was just released from prison on a 20 year sentence for um, as a, uh, a uh, violent sexual offender who uh, in relation to children. Um, and now I'm kind of glad that I got into the conversation because it's not easy to let your children, your grandchildren out into the street or into the backyard even uh, when you have someone in, that's in your neighborhood like that, but they have the right to live in our neighborhoods. It's our responsibility to check the registry every once in a while um, and make sure that, you know, we're taking the safest measures for our children. And with that being said, I'm going to invite um, Sir, uh, Sergeant Slattery from the uh, police department, and he's going to give us some data that's been happening here, and he's going to cover, I think, a five-year stance. Welcome, Sergeant. Thank you. Uh, I have packets I was able to get a um, PowerPoint. Get okay. Also, too, Sergeant, explain that your data is limited just to your department, not necessarily with um, DHS, correct? The sheriff's department, um, and any other agencies that 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 take care of child abuse here. Just within the Special Victims Unit, Pueblo Police Department. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, inviting us here. Um, 
this gives me an opportunity to kind of explain a little bit about what SVU does, give you guys some statistics from 2019 to current year. Um, the detectives assigned to the special victim section investigate crimes related to uh, child maltreatment, including child abuse, child sex abuse, and child deaths. They also investigate crimes against at risk that encompasses person over 70 years of age, adults and excuse me, children with developmental disabilities, and those with certain physical disabilities. Additionally, SVU detectives are involved with the Internet Crimes Against Children's Task Force, also known as ICAC. Domestic violence, runaways, juvenile human trafficking, and protection order violations occur within our jurisdiction. SVU has allotted six detectives, one sergeant, and one senior clerk. One of the positions is a high-tech crime position that has been vacant since September of last year. Since 2020, the unit has lost five detectives to other agencies, retirement, or who have left the career field altogether. We currently have two detectives, a senior clerk, and myself. I'd also note through our initial response to an acute response may be fast moving initially in order to assure the safety of the victim and get those safety me mechanisms into place. Our investigations would be considered cold crimes. This is because the majority of our crimes are often not reported immediately due to lack of evidence, lack of witness, witnesses or amount of times that have, I'm sorry, amount of time that has elapsed since the incident. Our focus is building credibility for the victim. This is done through numerous interviews with family members, school staff, friends and acquaintances, and retrieving items such as medical records. These records will sometimes show a co comorbidity, such as treatments for STDs, UTIs, or complaints of physical ailments that may lend credence to the victim's account. Historically, of the cases routed through SVU, roughly 10% or less have an investigator assigned for follow-up on these investigations as patrol officers has handled most of them to completion. Due to our mandate, we focus mostly on felony and complex cases while providing training and continuous advisement to patrol in order to provide support on similar incidents that they may have. I would also note that the school resource officers have received additional training from SVU to include coordinating with partner agencies like the CAC, Child Advocacy Center, to complete investigations that occur within their schools. All of these cases are reviewed by me weekly to assure uh, the investigations are complete and thorough before uh, I put a status on them of being forwarded to the district attorney or if they're inactivated. We are often asked to complete follow-up contacts and reviews for outside agencies that are investigating a crime where one of the involved parties lives in our jurisdiction. Most of these requests involve forensic interviews of children, but also include contacting involved others or coordinating with somebody from that agency and coming here to complete interviews or executing search warrants. Additionally, we partner with federal agencies to help with the investigations regarding computer crimes and interstate and international criminal involvement that will sometimes be taken for federal charging. We work closely with the uh, Provo Child Advocacy Center who provides support and interviews with child victims and their families uh, in our investigations. We also provided entrance to the CAC after hours if, need, uh, if we need to use one of their interview rooms. Of, these, of our detectives, one is a certified forensic interviewer and the second is in the process of becoming uh, certified. Detectives have this training for occasions when it's after hours or there's extenuating circumstances that a child needs to be interviewed quickly. Forensic interview is a trauma and cleaning technique that requires 56 hours of training through the Colorado Children's Alliance of in Denver, at least two annual peer reviews and ongoing training education to obtain and keep the certification. Due to the personal effects uh, of these crimes, victims are often are not ready to talk about what happened or only against bits and pieces of what happened to them, um, which is sometimes not enough to establish probable cause. If a victim does not wish to do anything at the time we contact them, we provide them with resources or assistance through the, the CAC or ACOBA and inactivate the case. If in the future they wish to talk about what happened, the case is reactivated. Because of this, sometimes uh, work on these cases, sometimes we work on cases that are years old, adding to the elapsed time from the initial report. Uh, forensic interviewing uses opening questions rather than direct leading questions. This allows victims to bring up the subject in their own words. This technique is for child victims. However, uh, detectives also use it for witnesses 
and suspects, the time for the interviews are lengthy, but they are able to obtain much more information from people speaking to them in this way. Many of our investigations are done in tandem with the Department of Human Services. Their timeline is much shorter than ours, and they require less of a standard to make decisions regarding a child's welfare as their focus is on the civil side of the investigation. Typically, our investigations require on average 150 to 200 million hours to complete. Wellness is a big concern for anybody that works in this area. <clears throat> The manner in which a crime is committed and having to listen to and or retell the same story several times given by the victims leads to vicarious or secondary trauma and over time, compassion fatigue. Investigators also run into moral suffering due to the amount of time, effort, and emotional ties to each case and those that they affect. For this, supervised, uh, supervision maintains caseload even between the detectives to include trying to diversify the types of investigations they carry. Additionally, in 2023, SVU went through approximately 16 hours of wellness training specifically for persons investigating special, uh, special victims' crimes. This was a free webinar offered through the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Program and was completed in several modules lasting an hour and a half to two hours each, which minimized the time taken away from work. Additionally, supervision makes an effort to have the unit step away from their work and go to lunch as a unit. So as right now, um, our statistics, what we have from 2019, uh, there's three areas that, that uh, special victims uh, oversees. Domestic violence, special victims, which includes the at-risk, um, child crime, child against crime, um, crimes against children, and restraining order violations. Uh, so in 2019, domestic violence, we had 1,643 cases. Uh, special victims, 2,023 uh, cases. Uh, with restraining orders, it was eight. So these are, these are criminal reports. Our, our unit usually gets between 3,500 and 4,000 cases sent through us every year. Most of those are not criminal. They're like custody disputes, um, welfare checks, that kind of thing. So we don't, I don't, I don't count those in these, these numbers. Uh, 2020, we had 7,127 domestics, 1,737 special victims, and 34 restraining order violations. Uh, 2022, we had 1,598 domestic violence. Special victims was 1,667 uh, and 53 restraining order violations. Now, as these numbers continue to maintain their trajectory up or down, my detective's numbers went down. So we weren't able to investigate all of the ones that we wanted to. Uh, so, for instance, 2021, I had four to five detectives working. Um, we we worked approximately 350 cases that year. In 2023, we had 1,098 domestic violence cases, 1,389 special victims cases, and 143 uh, ROVs, which is the restraining orders. We uh, investigated approximately 200 cases there. Um, but due to investigators leaving the, the department, we operated within 16 to 50% of our manning. Um, so our, our ability to work those cases to um, the number of cases that we normally did went down. Um, 2024, this year so far, we've had two, and this is as of March 13th, so January 1st through March 13th, we've had 201 domestic violence cases uh, received 248 special victims and 33 restraining orders. Um, we are currently working about 35 active cases uh, between my two detectives and myself. Uh, we're working at 30% manning. This year, Chief Miller has approved an internship with the SVU, bringing one patrol asset to work six weeks at a time with investigators. Currently, there are nine individuals who have been asked to be on this program and will be rotated through the unit gaining training and experience while investigating uh, the cases with us. 
This will assist their work on patrol once they return there, which will actually help with the cases uh, that they put towards uh, forward to us. We also continue to utilize light duty personnel to assist in tasks such as admin duties, create reports from outside agency mailings and emails and follow up on runways. We'll often receive a, a letter with a report saying that they've received a, a, a crime, a, a report of a crime that occurred here. So we'll, we'll have to make a new report for that. They'll do follow-up phone, phone calls and obtain evidence for investigations in order to can, continue or close cases. Unfortunately, um, the year before last, we had CBI helping us. They, they took care of some cases for us because uh, we were so short. This year, they're so busy with their own cases that they haven't been able to help very much. So I do appreciate the help that they did do, though. Um, I'm sorry, I probably should have told you that the, the numbers I was throwing out at you were not in your packet. Uh, the ones that you received, um, there should be four or five uh, um, pieces of paper. So child sex abuse, um, you can see on the graph, there's uh, aggravated incest, sex assault on a child, sex assault on a child position of trust, uh, sex assault, uh, forcible fondling, sodomy, girl boy, um, ages 15 to 17, um, and then 16 years of age, less than 16 years of age, and unlawful sexual contact. I will tell you that I think that these numbers aren't going to give us a true feeling of where we are. Even nationally, the statistics, nah, I'm sorry, the statistics only have uh, up to 2021. COVID really didn't do us a favor with this. Um, I think that we still are recovering from that. We're really not going to be able to find um, a true number or get a really a good pulse on what's going on with kids uh, for probably another two or three years. I personally think that the while the numbers are, are trending down, I think that's because there's a lot of kids that are in um, uh, online schools, so there's not a whole lot of oversight with people being able to see these kids to actually uh, report, so they're still living with their abusers, and they're just shut in. Um, so hopefully, in another couple of years, we'll have a better feeling of what's going on with these, with these cases. Um, I also was asked to provide the, uh, the registered sex offenders list, and I got that from Detective Shea. Um, Pueblo currently has 553 registered sex offenders as of 321.24. The only recent Colorado law that affected registered sex offenders was House Bill 21 1064, which automatically removes juvenile sex offenders from the registry seven years after the conviction or age 25, whichever uh, occurred last. Uh, he writes, I have not seen a significant influx of new registered sex offenders locally in the past five years. Uh, and he gives some rough numbers below uh, from active RSOs and non-compliance warrants issued. 2020, uh, 2019, there were 524 sex offenders. He authored 29 uh, warrants for failure to comply. 537 RSOs in 2020, 40 of those received warrants 2021, 562 uh, of that, he wrote 24 warrants. 2022, 549 RSOs with 21 warrants issued. And then last year, 542 uh, RSOs with 16 uh, warrants issued on that. So at this point, I would like to Thank you for your time, giving me the opportunity to, to come up here and fumble around on my words. But um, uh, I think this is a this is a very um, you know it's what everybody wants to do, but nobody wants to do it. Uh, the, the light needs to be shed on on how many kids are being abused, um, and then continue to work towards rectifying that. So, thank you. And um, thank you for your time. And we'll have so we'll have a couple of questions for you if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, so let me 
did you find out of the 542 of offenders that we have, that, that seems to be the consistent number from 2019. It's like 500 every year, you know. Um, how many of the registered sex offenders do you have? Is there data that supports how many of reoffend locally? I have to apologize because I don't know. He works in a different unit than I do. So I don't know. I don't have any kind of uh, personal knowledge of what he's he's got going on. Okay. And and that's fine. I just was wondering if that data is available so that we I, can get it. I imagine so. I, I could definitely ask Detective Shea. Yeah, if you could do that okay. and let me know. Um, and then also, um, maybe I, I was told too, and I noticed it on some of the registries that if they're homeless, they don't have to register with an address. Is there a law now that protects them that they could just register as homeless rather than put an address? Yes. As long as they make themselves known that they're at least in the community. And they're supposed to check in on their their timely requirements that they're supposed to come in and, and do that. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, the people can be homeless and be released as registered sex offenders. I am, And I'm sorry, I haven't paid attention. I don't know if you've paid attention to legislation lately. Is any of the maybe more stringent laws being passed up at the Capitol or are they pretty much all going to the wayside? I'm sorry. I'm the wrong person to talk to. You about That's okay. About that. That's okay. Um, and questions? Yeah. Um, Councillor Gomez. It's, uh, going back a little bit, 30 years, um, I created a thing called the COVID program. I'm sure you're familiar yes, with that. Yes, sir. And the reason we did that was because we knew at that time, 30 years ago, that the officers needed help. They didn't have enough manpower. And look at today. So I'm just curious. Back then, the criteria for officers was a four-year degree. And then it's a two-year degree. Then it was a high school diploma. Now it's a GED. And I'm just wondering how it's going to impact because officers eventually become detectives. Okay? And I, I do a lot of sexual assault stuff with the investigations. But how do you think that's going to impact you down the road? Are you seeing litigation coming down the road? Are you seeing other, do you feel you're going to ever ha get back to where you can be, have a good criteria of officers to work with? I mean, do you have any feelings about that? Well, that's the hope we all get. We need people so bad right now. Uh, and it's not just here, it's nationally. Um, I don't think an education uh, is being a requirement is something that is going to hinder the investigations um, because there are people who like these uh, interns that are coming up to, to work with me. Um, we have nine officers that are going to roll back out on patrol and they're going to be able to take all of that information with them so that they can apply it to really any of their investigations because SVU is a different monster from any other unit. Um, you have to dig a little deeper because we don't have evidence half the time. So I think that's going to help them. Uh, and, and in turn, they can start teaching other people as well. So I think we're still going to be doing all right with, with the types of, of investigations we get out of those. How many more detectives do you believe you need to do an adequate job? You there yet? You're not there. Oh, no. How, how far are you again? Uh, I got two. We're authorized six. Wow. Okay. Wow. In, in regards to what he said about education, I'm sure that before they promoted your, to your department, though, you have do put on specialized training, certifications, and so yes. forth. Yes. And we do. Uh, the department really pushes that that uh, these officers go out and uh, obtain training. The bad part is a lot of people will come up to a unit thinking they like it, but then they don't and they go right back out. So there's a lot of money and time and effort that goes into these people. Um, by bringing people up, they can actually see what we do, if they're gonna like it, and then they can start focusing on their training a little bit better. Yeah, you, it, like you said, it's a very, um, it could be very de detrimental to your mental well-being. Absolutely, yes. Um, but somebody's got somebody's got to help these kids. Somebody you know? got to, yeah. And so thank you for that. Um, Councilor Martinez, did you have something? Okay. All right. Well, thank you for the information and I really appreciate it. And, you know, keep up the good work and, you know, we're with you out there. Let us know. We can't, we can't help unless we know. That's, that's the one thing of bringing this awareness is the public, you know, can volunteer. They can, um, 
be a voice for at legislation against some of the child abuse legislation that comes up. Um, citizens can come forward at the Capitol all the time um, in favor of maybe more stringent laws. Um, not uh, obviously not decriminalizing. We, I mean, we have enough of that. That's we're stuck in a lot of places, negative places today, not just with the child sexual abuse, with the decriminalization and always donations. Donations always help these organizations um, keep, you know, keep the doors open to serve the children of our community. Thank you. Officer, uh, Sergeant, for everything you do. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you I appreciate coming here tonight. Um, and next we have um, the Child Advocacy Center. They play also another important role in our community um, in working with these kids to help them, the, the cases um, get through and help them get the services that they need. And tonight um, we have Jennifer Chavez and her staff. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Make sure it's on. Thank you. Um, we appreciate um, you having us here. Um, again, you know, we're here to talk about what the Child Advocacy Center does, but also to bring awareness um, to child abuse, the Child Abuse Awareness Month in April. Mm -hmm. um, so we get the question asked all the time, what does the Child Advocacy Center do? We give a voice to children. Um, our evidence-based services, such as forensic interviewing, family advocacy, medical and mental health services, are all trauma-informed to empower our children and have families heal. The Child Advocacy Center, or excuse me, the Child Advocacy Movement started in 1985 when a little girl by the name of Robin asked a district attorney in Huntsville, Alabama, a simple question. Don't you adults talk to each other? This is after she had to tell her story of sexual abuse 13 times to 13 different people, oftentimes in a cold, sterile environment. Bud Kramer was that attorney. He saw the need to create a better system to help abuse children. The social service and the criminal justice systems at that time were not working together in an effective manner that children can trust, adding to the children's emotional distress, creating a segmented, repetitious, and often frightening experience for these children. From this, the multidisciplinary team model was born. As luck would have it, a social worker from Pueblo, Kathy Redman, attended a conference where Bud was presenting the MDT model. Without hesitation, she knew Pueblo needed this service. In the fall of 1986, the Public Child Advocacy Center was established. Thanks to the perseverance of former district attorney, Gus Sandstrom, detectives from the Public Police Department, Kathy and her team from DHS, as well as other community leaders. We are proud to boost that the Public Child Advocacy Center is the first in Colorado and the sixth in the nation. Today, we still follow that MDT models with our partners from the Public Police Department, Sergeant Slattery and his team, of course, the Public Police Department, Department of Human Services, the 10th Judicial District, medical and mental health professionals, as well as our staff. We are accredited by the National Children's Alliance. And what we do is we provide specialized forensic interviews to children ages three to the ages of 18, as well as adults with disabilities. Medical services are provided for children of any of all ages, as well as their siblings and as, um, with adults with disabilities. All our services are done in a kid-centric, home-like environment with no cost to the families, but more importantly, no cost to the agencies requesting our services. The cases we see of, mal of child maltreatment include physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse. We see children come in for neglect, including medical neglect, internet crimes against children, human and sex trafficking. We see runaways and we see witnesses to crime, such as domestic violence, homicide, suicide, and assault. These cases are brought to us by our law enforcement, by law enforcement and Department of Human Services. We not only serve Pueblo County, but we serve counties out of Otero, Crowley, Bent, 
Kiowa, Prowers, and Los Animas. The FBI, CBI, and Department of Homeland Security, as well as out-of-state agencies, also use our services. Another question that we get is, why doesn't PA, the Child Advocacy Center serve every child for which a report of child maltreatment is made? You saw the numbers that Mike gave. We are, we are contract. Excuse me. We are contacted when a case in is in the midst of in investigation, and at that point, it has been decided by the investigating agencies that our services are needed. Although we work closely with the investigators and our multidisciplinary team, we are not the entity that decides what cases should be accepted for further investigation. That is law enforcement, and that is the Department of Human Services. Our role is to provide a neutral interview and trauma-informed wraparound services for the kiddos and their non-offending caregivers. To ensure we are inclusive to the child and caregiver's needs, we provide these services not only in English, but as well as in Spanish. And we also have resources to ASL interpreters. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Basilia, who will speak more about forensic interviewing and our MDT. Hello, thank you so much. So my name is Vasilia Hunt. I'm a bilingual child forensic interviewer at the Pueblo Child Advocacy Center. So um, Sergeant Sadi and um, Executive Director Jennifer Chavez have mentioned um, forensic interviews a little bit, um, but I'd like to chat just about what they are. So forensic interviews are essentially a conversation between a trained forensic interviewer and a child. In that interview, a child is telling their story of abuse, and the interviewer is listening and asking questions and gathering information about what happened. While that's happening, we have our investigative partners like um, the assigned detectives or the caseworkers assigned who will be observing, watching, and listening to that interview in another room. Um, forensic interviews are audio and video recorded, and once the interview is over, that tape, that recording goes with um, the investigator, whether, again, that's um, the detective or the caseworker, and that then becomes introduces their evidence, and then we'll use that kind of as the case progresses. Forensic interviewers are specially trained. Um, Tara and myself have had um, lots and lots of hours of training um, to make sure that we are trained to be able to talk with kiddos in all of these different situations and with all of the different cases that we see because they are so different. Um, it was mentioned earlier about um, you know offenders and things like that. Um, something I'd like to mention is Really, I think back in the day, um, when we were talking about effect offenders and sex offenders specifically, um, it was kind of like the, the creepy person in the van who was um, trying to uh, lure children in with candy or, um, you know, I mean, help me find a puppy, things like that. Um, but that's really not what it looks like. Um, offenders are in your homes. Um, a lot of the children that we see specifically when it comes to sexual abuse are uh, perpetrated on by their um, by their parents. Um, specifically at the Public Child Advocacy Center, um, one of our largest statistics is seeing um, young girls little girls ages four to six who have been sexually perpetrated on by their biological fathers. Um, so that is also something that I would like to mention is something that is out there and something that happens a lot. Um, so yes, while offenders are certainly um, strangers and people out in the community and neighborhood, um, they are also unfortunately in your own homes. Um, speaking of the MDT or the multidisciplinary team, we work with all the entities that um, Jennifer mentioned, I really we come together to collaborate and make sure that these children aren't falling through the cracks or being overlooked. Um, so we need to talk about these cases and we make sure that we are um, helping the families to get the services that they need and we're um, minimizing duplicating services and we're just making sure that we are um, helping the child and not really traumatizing the child. That is another reason why forensic interviews are so important is that they really help limit the re-traumatization of children so that way they don't have to keep telling their story of abuse over and over and over again. And we um, have very trauma-informed um, uh, neutral non techniques that we use in these interviews to obtain that information. And again, it's just a community effort. Um, so we're very appreciative of our MDT and the partners 
um, that we work with, we also um, try to get out there and do outreach in the community so that way we can um, you know, inform others in the community of what we do. Um, we offer trainings on reporting child abuse, signs to look for, um, child abuse prevention. And so um, that is something that we, we at the PCAC love to do is go out and speak to the community about these things. Then I'll hand it over to Tara Chaparro. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tara Chaparro, and I am the other forensic interviewer at the Pueblo Child Advocacy Center. Um, just to piggyback on what Jennifer and Basilia had mentioned, um, while we do offer the service of a forensic interview, um, we also other offer other services to give that child and that family the beginning stages of that healing process, which is just as important as gathering the information and details behind what may have happened to them, what they may have experienced or witnessed. Um, so in conjunction with offering forensic interviews at our center, we also do offer um, mental health services as well as medical um, services. For the mental health services, really this can help to bridge the gap um, of waiting to get into mental, uh, mental health services. That is something that has just been on the uprise as a whole in our community um, nationwide. And waiting lists can be pretty extensive. And so that's where having that service at our center to kind of gap that waiting period um, comes in handy and begins that process of healing much more timely um, than just simply referring out to an outside agency. But we also do collaborate and work with our community mental health partners um, to provide the families with the best services that they need. It looks different for every family. It looks different for every situation. And so it's really um, getting in there. Um, we can provide screeners and complete screeners to look at symptoms, look at signs, look at elevated levels of trauma, emotional distress. Um, and then from there, kind of see what does that look like? And then do we need a full-on assessment and really dive more in depth to start peeling back the layers of the trauma and putting the correct services in place for the families? Um, and that's where the family advocacy piece of the uh, child public child advocacy center comes in. That is where the family advocate will be that support to the family and to the child, provide them with resources in the community, as well as for our outside agencies and counties that were mentioned that we service. It's also educating ourselves on their resources and what's available in a location that's closer to them. Um, so again, we will meet with that family. We will provide them with resources. We will help them with referrals. We will help to remove barriers of transportation um, by whether we're setting up med management, offering cab rides, gas vouchers, or gift cards, any of those things to really be able to help the family get that access easily to services is where we come in. Um, support continues and is ongoing. We don't want families, we don't want children to fall through the cracks. So every other week until the family um, says otherwise, they will get follow-up calls and supports from us just to make sure that they have gotten in the right direction, referrals have been completed, they've made contact with providers um, if they're not getting that service in-house with us and that has gone elsewhere. Or if they may already have that set up, we're just checking in to see how that is going and see if we can offer any other forms of support. Um, not only mental health, but it could just be general resources for food, housing, um, guiding them in the direction to, for example, the DA's office for victim services and additional help and funding that they may need there. Um, we'll never leave a family or a child in an elevated level of stress or trauma. They're coming in talking about a lot of heavy things, probably some of the worst, if not the worst thing that's happened to them. And not only is the child a victim in that and affected by that, so is the family and the caregivers. So with all of those resources, we are also um, getting ready to introduce support groups for the care providers um, to help them kind of navigate resources give them a place to speak, have other families and providers they can relate to that are experiencing similar things. Um, so we definitely do take a high regard in supporting families and beginning that healing process and working through that trauma piece as well. So we do offer an array of services. Um, we also work with our medical forensic nurse team through Parkview or UC Health. Um, 
they do come in and contract with us as well as um, our the lead physician, Dr. Sarah Bryant. Um, and so they will come in and they will provide uh, non-acute medical exams. Um, any We do not do DNA or evidence collection of that nature, but they can come in for a overall well um, child exam just to ensure that their bodies are okay. Um, or just a in general well child check because some families may not have a care provider. So just so they know and can have eyes seen on them and see what is going on. Um, the medical team can take photographs if needed. They will complete diagrams and complete medical charts. That's all kept confidential and behind um, locked uh, quarters in our uh, uh, facility. The only people that do get those confidential photos are law enforcement investigators. Um, DHS, uh, while they can get medical charts and diagrams, do not get the actual photos. They would have to request that through law enforcement or the assigned investigator. Um, we can also extend the medical service to their siblings as well. Um, so not only just for that child victim, but also we can get some eyes and also look over the siblings as well. Um, so we also do provide medical for the family. So we definitely don't want to leave them without support, guidance, and just someone to reach out to as well. Um, if a family decides they are doing well and no longer lead our services, and if things change because life happens, they can absolutely contact our office and we can continue to support them for as long as they need that. Anything else, lady? No, um, again, we um, encourage you to come and visit our center, take a tour. Um, you know, ask some more questions if you like, but more come and see the great work that my team does. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones, they're, they're, they're the rock stars. Um, you know, they were very modest in their training, but they are specifically um, trained in forensic interviewing. Um, they have over hundreds of hours of ongoing education. So it just isn't the minimal um, mm -hmm. ongoing education. You're such a valuable resource for our community because not everyone has has, has these um, opportunities in the community. You know, unfortunately, you're not set up to solve this issue we have here in our city. You're just here to help with the fallout of what's happening here. And, you know, we don't get to hear it much as a community because they're they are protected, mm -hmm. um, these children, as far as media and so forth. So you don't hear a lot of statistics um, or see a lot of things in the paper. Sometimes it has to be really extreme, you know, mm -hmm. once they've passed. Yeah. I, I think the most important thing is, again, um, the takeaway here is we are giving the children a voice. Mm -hmm. uh, um, a voice that they may not know that they had. Mm -hmm. um, we're empowering them. So. Um, and we don't do it alone. You know, um, we work with our MDT. We work very close with uh, Sergeant Slattery and his team, the Sheriff's mm -hmm. Office, and um, DHS. So we, contrary to belief, we work well together. Mm -hmm. um, the, or into the District Attorney's Office. I apologize if I forgot to mention that. But we all work well together mm -hmm. to solve this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it takes a team. It yeah. takes a village. Yeah, it does. Definitely. And this community, you know, like I said, to bring out the awareness, just to check your own neighborhood to see, make sure your children are safe mm -hmm. um, and to volunteer, to donate money, um, you know, to be a voice um, with the legislators as far as getting some laws definitely. into place that offers more protection and more consequences. Uh, and then um, Basilia had mentioned that we also provide the outreach um, training on the, our, our four pillars of um, identifying child abuse, but more importantly, how to report that. So mm -hmm. again, we invite our community to get in touch with us and set up a time for us to go out and provide that training or that outreach to them. Mm -hmm. Any questions from council? Um, Mr. Uh, Councilor Hernandez. My words cannot do justice for what you do and when you look into a child's eyes and those eyes look back at you for hope can't imagine that yeah they get to look back at these women right here these strong women who provide that hope for our children yes i did have a quick question jennifer mm -hmm. um so sergeant slattery presented some data earlier 
um, about how we've kind of seen a steady decline in cases kind of since 2020, 2020-ish. Mm -hmm. Have your office seen the same thing? And is that because of COVID and less eyes on kids or um, talk a little bit about that? So as I mentioned, um, law enforcement and DHS, they have to bring the cases to us. So if their numbers are low, our numbers are low as well. Um, so that's where our numbers are pretty consistent with what he had mentioned there is, um, cause I'll say PD brings in probably 90 to 95% of their cases to us, to the, to the center. So, um, that's, you know, that's one point I'd like to make, but the other one is again, with, um, the pandemic where our numbers were high, which is a little, um, inconsistent with it. It just shows that the work that was being done, um, we wanted to make sure that these kiddos, we had eyes on these kiddos and that we were providing those services. It is, it's going to be years before these kiddos have the strength to come forward to tell somebody to report that. So as Mike mentioned, probably a couple, two, three years. Um, we are seeing that decline because these, the kids that are on in school are not in, and this is not a slam on traditional school or you know on, online, but oftentimes they're being um, schooled by their perpetrator. That's why they're schooled. In most cases, and again, I'm, that's not a slam on online school or anything like that. When I'm out and about at the grocery store, first of all, I have no idea how you guys do this. You're a literal angel. I don't like. I kudos to you all for doing this every day. Um, when I'm out and about at the grocery store, what are three things that I need to look for if I'm going to report child abuse? So let me just ask everybody, um, if you have a suspicion that something might be going on, please call and make a report. You don't have to have concrete evidence. You don't have to have, you know, proof, videos, photos, or anything like that. Um, if you just have a suspicion that something is going on, we encourage you to report because you can be saving that child's life. Um, Trust your gut. If something doesn't feel right, maybe if you see a kiddo who, um, you know, maybe looks a little neglected, maybe their parents are speaking to them in a way where you're like, hey, that's not really appropriate. Um, anything like that, any feeling that you might get, um, it's those times where we really encourage to make a report. And you can remain anonymous. Um, so I know sometimes people might have reservations about reporting because they might feel like they have to divulge all this information about themselves and things like that. Um, but you can rena remain anonymous um, in reporting that. And we just want to get that out um, and really encourage the community and everybody to make those reports if you feel like something, um, you know, might be off. And you make those reports to law enforcement or to DHS. They have the 800 number where you can make that that report. And I'm just going to say from personal experience, don't give up because I have called, with, you know, it, it takes, you know, you to set in your mind I got to make this call because this isn't right, you know, and you get a little pushback and keep persistent. I mean, you don't want the stigma that, oh, you're taking children away from their parents. But, you know, my, the little victim that I, he's, he's now permanently adopted um, into a home with his biological siblings who were adopted before he was even born. You know, and that was better than living on the Fountain River from Parkview Hospital. It was like he was 18 months old by the time I even saw them pull him out of the basket there when they were shooting up and freebasing in front of Jack in the Box that day. Those types of situations that some of these kids are coming from. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for your Thank time. You. Thank you. Are we going to go through the work session? Okay. We're going to go ahead and adjourn and move the work session to, I mean, the executive session to the council meeting. Okay. The time is 719. This meeting is adjourned and we'll be back in five minutes.